This is Senior Pastor Larry McCord, pastor of New Birth Christian Ministries, Incorporated, located on Long Island, New York, reaching out to you wherever you may hear the sound of my voice, sending out the Word of God. I know many of you are troubled today, but you don't need to be afraid because you're God's property. And he said, no weapon formed against you will prosper. This is taken from Isaiah 54, verse 17. The only thing you can rely on is the word of God. Tune in and listen to New Birth Christian Ministries on YouTube channel. I look forward to seeing you. Greetings in the name of Jesus. Today's sermon, I am sermon at, is going to be on the water to wine, which I was able to find this information um, on christiantoday.com and madeworthy.com. So with the help of that looking on the internet, this is what I found out about the water and wine. So John, John 2, 1 to 11, the water being turned to wine was one of Jesus's first recorded miracles, which made it a memorable one. It carries for us messages that go beyond the apparent phenomenon that people witness that today. Here are three lessons we learn from this miracle. So lesson one, Jesus can provide all we need. God won't provide all you ask for, especially if he knows it's going to destroy you. That being said, we doubt God will turn water to wine for an alcoholic today. Water in these times was not the safest to drink. Wine was safer. It was watered down to make it more palatable and less toxic, toxicating. So it was easier for them to drink the wine so they didn't get uh, sick by the water because, you know, the plumbing wasn't like how we have plumbing today and the water wasn't filtered or anything like that. So it was it, wine kept them healthier, believe it or not. But he can and will provide miraculously for, need, for needs he knows must be met to empower you to pursue him for his purpose. So John Fifth John 5, 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. The key is to ask according to his will and through Christ Jesus. But before we move forward, when, when Mary came to Jesus and asked him, told him that, they were out, they didn't have enough wine. There was no more wine. Jesus turned to his mother and said, what is, what is that my problem? That's not my problem. Why are you bothering me almost, you know? And then she turned to the servants and says, do, do whatever he asks. But I wanted to bring to your attention that at this time, Jesus, the reason he was a little annoyed with his mom was he was putting off his duty that his father had asked him to do. He was going, he was trying his best to prolong it as much as he could, because once he did his first miracle, that means that now his journey yeah. for him to sacrifice himself for our sins was going to start. So think of it. I mean, we know what he did. He died on the cross for us. All the ridicule, all the uh, things people said about him, telling him that what he was saying and what he was preaching was not the word of God. 
The Pharisees, of course, gave him a hard time. And think of you want having to accomplish something. And every time you turn around, it's somebody um, telling you that what you're doing is, is not true. So he had a lot to do and he had he had to prepare himself and get himself in that the mindset that he was going to die for our sins. So now you see why when Mary asked him to do his first miracle, he was a little standoffish for her, but he was obedient to his mom. He honored his mother and he went, he got up and he went and he turned that water into wine, right? Lesson two, stop focusing on the wine. When asked by his mother to do something about the shortage of wine, Jesus responded saying, woman, what does that have to do with me? Which I said previously, John 2, 5. This statement almost seems rhetorical. Why? Because the miracle had everything to do with God. So what is your wine today? Is your wine maybe a job you want, finances you're praying for, a house you want to buy, whatever it is, don't let it take your eyes off the person of Christ. Now, this is what this is saying that when we see that scripture, we always think of the miracle he made, the miracle that he performed. We're like, wow, he turned water into wine. That is amazing. But what it is we need to focus on is that Jesus is the miracle worker. This is the person you go to. You know, we don't we don't go to God only for him to do something great for us. We go to to Jesus. We go to God for him to help us with what we're going through, right? A lot of times we pray and we we're praying for a house and we're praying for this and we're praying for that and we're waiting on a miracle. What we have to do is pray and ask God to help us and for us to help others. And when we help others, this is when what we're asking for, because he already knows what we stand in need of, right? So when we take our minds off of ourselves, we eat, that's when God will open up and help our situation. So this is almost like this is what he, uh, God wanted us to, to see because his disciples were in awe of his first miracle. But they understood a little more. They knew where this miracle was coming from. He took the wine to the um, to the master of the wedding. You know, he was so impressed. Oh my goodness. Every, you know, he, uh, usually they give out in the beginning the good wine. And then as everyone gets intoxicated, then they give out the watered down wine. But the wine that Jesus made, think of it. He took the molecules of water and changed it and made wine. Nobody. No, not one scientist could do that. So think of how much, how, how God rules everything. He has even the control over water that he could, he didn't have to step on any grapes. He right. didn't have to take time for the, the wine to ferment. It was done in an instant, right? And a lot of times when we're asking God to help us with something, it could be in an instant or he'll make us wait. And the reason he makes you wait is because there he has to do a work in you and behind the scenes because he has to prepare whatever it is that you're asking him for and make sure because when you ask God and you follow God's will, whatever he gives you remains. But when you do it in your own might, 
it only lasts for a short period of time, right? Now, the wine, when he changed that wine, that water into wine, it didn't last for two minutes. They had wine for however long. I think in, in, in those times, a wedding didn't last one day. It lasted a couple days. And they had wine for that, you know, as long as the wedding went on. And I'm sure the owner of the uh, where they were having the wedding, he had good wine for a, a long time, you know. So any gift that Jesus gives to us, it's everlasting, you know, until or until he sees fit that he has to change you from one season to another. So this that is the importance of, of following God's will. It's so important that we, we follow his will, we are obedient to him. Because when we're not obedient to him, it just takes longer for whatever it is we're going through to um, be resolved. So lesson three, believe in the messenger, not just the message. The purpose of this miracle is made clear in John 2.11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So this, this miracle, even though they believed in Jesus, it just opened up their eyes more and their belief became stronger. And they're like, wow, who is this that he could turn water into wine? So now they believe that, yes, this was the Messiah and manifested his glory and his disciples believed him. The goal was to make people believe in Jesus first and foremost before anything else. Mm -hmm. So uh, this was his journey. And he knew that he was going to do other miracles, healing the sick, bringing sight to the blind, uh, curing the mute you know, cure, uh, healing anyone, uh, people with leprosy, you know. So these are all things that his disciple was going to um, be privy to. You know, they were going to see him do all these different things, uh, walking on water, um, calming a storm, all these different things that Jesus uh, did while they were with him or while he was with them, actually. When God causes miracles, he doesn't want us to just believe in miracles, signs, and wonders. He wants us to believe in him and to cause others to believe in him. The purpose of signs and wonders is to point to the power, person, and real reality of God. Not for us to have our fill of wine, bread, money, glory, fame, or whatever we get out of a miracle. You know, the point is not the message, but the messenger. What Jesus, who Jesus stands for. He's the son of God. His, God's only son that he had died for us so we could get have our sins forgiven. And we don't have condemnation for sins that we, you know, we don't feel condemnation for whatever it is we did wrong. That when we repent with a pure heart and mean it, that God will forget, will forgive us and, for, and cast that sin away. So what we have to do is not constantly repeat. Forgive me for the same thing over and over and over. He already forgave you for that sin. So he wants you now to move on because he wants you to grow as long as you don't go back doing it again and again. Only so many times that he will forgive us because if you a repeat offender and you think that he's a genie in a bottle, that's not the way, you know. You have to realize that once you ask for that forgiveness, he forgives you. He shows you that mercy and he expects you to move forward and continue to grow and do better and to help others 
because you're an example of what you went through and now you can help somebody through it also. We have to go out and help others. And through helping others, God will help us. And that's what he wants. And that's what he, he ex, you know, expressed to his dis disciples. So as we move ahead, um, you see, uh, I was coming to a conclusion, I think. Let me see. Um, this was the part where Jesus was reluctant to participate and obey his mom and kind of impatiently states, what does that have to do with me? And this is what I was saying before. My time has not yet come. Because think of it sometimes when maybe you have, let's say, uh, you're going to do your exam, your road test. Mm -hmm. And you know you practice, yes, you practice and you drove around with your mom or your dad or you went to drive an ed, driver's ed. And here comes the day and you're apprehensive because you're not sure of yourself. And you almost don't want to go take the test but you have to do it. So Mary kind of gave him a little nudge. Yeah. So Jesus was trying to put aside put aside having to, to do any miracles a little longer his, for his higher calling. Just like us, our first instincts are usually to resist whatever various for whatever various reasons and for the most part it's fear fear keeps us from wanting to move forward fear of the unknown right mm -hmm. and this was uh, a little bit of fear on jesus's part because he didn't know what he was going to face but as long as he looked up and trusted his father he wouldn't have fear because he know he knew God was going to take care of him. Mary pretty much tells Jesus to get with the program. She gives him a stern encouragement, gives him the stern encouragement he needs to leave his comfort zone and continue his spiritual growth. This is when Jesus' acceptance of his sac of the sacrifice he was going to make for mankind. It's not easy leaving old teachings, traditions, energies, and habits behind. Jesus and his disciples were all invited. They were all invited and must make conscious decisions to accept what Jesus was going to go through. They, were, they weren't aware of the journey they were going to have to take by following Jesus, but he re reassured them. And he did tell them it wasn't going to be easy being his disciple. And he, they, he sent them out to produce more fruit, to help others. As he, as Jesus sent them out, he went to prepare and pray to get ready for his journey for his sacrifice, you know, he, he did, I mean, think of, of what God gave us, his only son, any parent, do you think any parent nowadays would want to do that? Oh my God, we would probably fight to the nail. No, <laughs> not my child, <laughs> you know, but God gave Jesus, the strength. Mary felt it. Mary, it broke Mary's heart when Jesus came to her. After getting his disciples, he went to visit his mom. And he sat down and he told her that his time was getting close. And she knew it from since he was born. 
you know, they guided him. They had to work together because he was an, uh, not an unusual child, but an exceptional human being slash God, you know. And they weren't raising a normal child. They were raising a child of God. And they had to learn themselves because with a normal child, you do normal things, bump bruises, discipline, that sort of thing. But by the time he was 12, he was in the synagogues preaching. I mean, they searched for him for, I think it was three days. And when they came in and he said, I'm about my father's business. And so Mary and Joseph had to learn what that meant. And then once they had to come together that yet, you know, even though he's, we haven't, we have to raise this child as our son. He had very important stuff that he had to do. And they had to understand that also, but They were doing the fleshly thing of a mother and father, you know, and Jesus had to do his godly thing, which was beyond the flesh, fleshly world. And they had to learn that also. So when his miracle came, the first miracle came, and he had to change this water into wine. In his mind, he was like, okay, it's starting. This is my journey to the cross. You know, he had to accept that for himself. And his mother gave him a little nudge that you can't put this off any longer. You have to do it. This is the time. And the wedding, which shows a bride and groom or bride, bride and groom or bridegroom, as they say, Um, he was our bridegroom, you know, because that's who we're waiting for to come back, our bridegroom. So as we conclude, as you see, there are several messages in the recounts of the wedding at Canaan Galilee. Jesus is our bridegroom. Our bridegroom is coming back and we need to be prepared. We need to attend service, help others, pick up our Bibles and read it more so we stay in the word and stay in one mind and one accord. We have to prepare ourselves. We don't want to be like those was it seven virgins that were without oil and they had to go get oil for their lamps and ended up missing the bridegroom? We don't want to be those. God made wine abundance, wine in abundance more than needed. That's the other lesson that God fills us to overflow. We just have to obey him and follow his will. He would, once we obey God and follow his will, he would give us so much that we can't keep it for ourselves. It forces us to share it when he gives it and he blesses us with so much. And you want to share it. You don't want to keep everything. You, You get to a point where I just have to give this away. And the more you give is the more you receive, right? (laughs) So I hope that this message has touched you guys. This is Pastor Larry McCord. Thank you for attending our services here at Newburgh. We appreciate your contribution and support. Please visit us here in person as well as on Zoom. May the blessings of the Lord go with you and go in peace.